join me in giving a warm reception to Ned Vizzini. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ned, and these are my books. Bam, son. That's it. That's the whole. No. The title of this one is it's kind of a funny story, but. Before we get started, I have kind of a funny story for you guys. It's the story of how I got here. It starts in Brooklyn, New York in 2004, when I was going through a rough time, as they say. I was working on this new book, but the book was terrible. Now also, as I worked on the book, I started to experience certain changes in my body. And every time you hear that phrase, you, you think of puberty, but this was like a weird anti-puberty, bad changes kind of thing, where the first thing that happened was I, I really stopped eating properly. I decided that the problem with the book was that it was in past tense. And past tense is boring, and present tense is exciting. And if only I could change the book from past tense to present tense, it would be great. So I sat down on my computer, hadn't eaten anything all day, and unfortunately, you can't do like a find replace on Microsoft Word for tense. If you want to change the tense of your book, you have to delete all the verbs and rewrite them. <laughs> and that was the point when I had made a phone call. And this phone call ended up in, it's kind of a funny story. Hello, the voice on the other line says. Hi, is this the suicide hotline, I ask? This is the Brooklyn Anxiety Management Center, the voice says. Oh, uh, we work with the Samaritans. We handle New York suicide hotline calls when they overflow. This is Keith speaking. <laughs> so that was a real phone call that I made. But I don't want it to be a real phone call that any of you guys have to make. By the end of our time together today, you will be able to identify three ways to keep from ever being on the phone with Keith. And they are, number one, keep your antenna up. Number two, don't sell yourself short. And number three, remember that stress is not a real threat. My father told me when I was just starting in the first grade, that my job over the next five or ten years in school, he said, you're going to have to do homework and you're going to have to do tests, but your real job is to keep your antenna up. As you go through school, if you're not picking up on what you really like to do, then you're going to get done with school and be in high school, and then you're going to be in college, and then you're going to be out getting a real job, and if you're getting a real job and you haven't in all of those years figured out what you actually enjoy, then you haven't done the real work of school. So keep your antenna up because if you're learning and using your mind, your mind will be a lot less likely to get into the kind of destructive thought patterns that can get you on the phone with Keith. Number two, don't sell yourself short. When I went to college, I know I really liked writing, but I never thought writing would make me any money. My parents told me that writing would make me any money. My friends told me that writing would make me any money, and history told me that writing would make me any money. I read about writers like Richard Yates, who wrote Revolutionary Road, one of the great realist novels of the 20th century. Uh, he died in a barely furnished apartment, sitting at a desk, beating roaches away from his keyboard. And so when I was in college, I majored in computer science. I acted out of fear, and I sold myself short. That's what you don't want to do. Finally, number three, strategies for not going crazy in college. Remember that stress is not a real threat. Now, this is really the most important one. And in order to discuss it, we have to go back. Back before the bicycle incident and before second grade, all the way back, back in this direction. Imagine, like, whooshing lines of time. <laughs> 25,000 years ago, okay, back 25,000 or 30,000 years ago to when we were all living in caves. Let's picture that for a minute. It's 25 or 30,000 years ago. 
We had simpler lives back then. Now, that's a fact. I'm not saying that we had better lives, but we did have simpler lives. And in that time, as primitive humans, our lives were typified by long periods of rest and then short periods of very intense activity. Today, it's your job to go and get some food from the berry patch. When you get to the berry patch, there's a large bear there. This is the kind of bear that could kick you over, lop your head off, and start eating your brain, just like in Grizzly Man. This is a serious threat to your well-being, this bear. And when you see the bear in the woods, your brain immediately goes through some very important changes. And these are changes that you might know as the fight or flight response. And they affect your body quickly. And the technical term for what happens to your body and brain is that you go into the sympathetic nervous system. Your digestion shuts down. And your body doesn't need to be wasting any energy digesting your food right now. It needs to be spending all its energy trying to not get digested by the bear. You've got to either run from the bear or fight the bear. Your heart rate starts to speed up at the same time so that you can pump more oxygen to your muscles. You start to breathe heavily to get more oxygen into your system. Blood vessels dilate to deliver that oxygen to your muscle cells. You start to sweat because whether you run or fight, you're going to be exerting yourself and heating your body up and you'll need to cool yourself down. And then last but not least, your sexual function stops completely because that's just not something that you need to be worried about. <laughs> <laughs> so you turn and you flee. Now you're surrounded by other members of your tribal community. Now you've got weapons, now you've got shelter. There's no need to fear the bear anymore. Gradually, your body slides back into the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the name of our bodies at rest. And if the sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight, the parasympathetic nervous system corresponds to, I always thought this was a cute phrase that the scientists came up with, rest and digest. So you go from fight or flight to rest and digest. That's how it works 25 or 30,000 years ago. That's not how it works today, because today our sympathetic nervous system isn't triggered by bears. It doesn't have to be. It's triggered by tests and essays and reports and extracurricular activities and interviews and finals and theses. Everything that we experience in our social lives, we view as threats. And stress is not your body's response to an actual threat, it's your body's response to a perceived threat. When you get a test that you're worried about, your body looks on it like a threat, just like the bear is a threat, just as real. And all the same things start happening to you. Your heart starts beating faster. You start hyperventilating. You start sweating. You can't eat the way I couldn't eat when I was trying to work on my book. Your body has tricked you into thinking that you're facing a mortal threat when all you're really facing is a test. If you live in a constant state of stress, you start to observe brain damage. After I had my little phone call with Keith and went into the psych hospital, I got a bit of a different perspective on things. And the moment that I really started to turn things around for myself had to do with the, the pay phone. Because when I was in the psych hospital, uh, they take your phone away, right? And there's just a pay phone. Uh, but the use of the pay phone is very regimented. It's like, uh, it's like prison. You know, it's like the new guys aren't allowed to use the phone. The people who've been there for a while are going to hoard the phone and keep it to themselves. At 7 o'clock, they shut the phone down, and I couldn't use it. And I just stood by the phone, and I just, I, I just couldn't deal with it. I just started kicking at the wall and cursing and asking how I would ever be able to call anybody, and people were going to find out where I was. And this other patient was sitting right there, and he said to me, What are you worried about, buddy? I said, hey, I had to use the phone, and now I can't use the phone. I'm not going to be able to call the people I have to call. What am I going to do? And the guy said, what are you worried about the phone for, man? Just, you need to make a call? Here. Just, just try the banana phone. And then he pulled the banana out, and he held it up. And I started laughing. And I believe very much in the healing power of laughter. And I'm going to keep this banana by my head for just a little longer. Um... I believe that anything that you can laugh at, you can control. And anything that you can laugh at, you can have power over. And who cares if I call the person I thought I needed to call? It's not going to kill me. It's really not. There are so few things that can really kill you in this world. But one of the things that can is stress. 
So when I left the hospital, I started writing. It's kind of a funny story. And I ditched that old book that I was changing all the tenses for. But there are a lot of people who never make it to the hospital, and there are a lot of people who never make it to the phone. For you guys, don't risk it. Just remember, keep your antenna up. Don't sell yourself short. And then remember always that stress is not a real threat. It's your body's response to a perceived threat. It evolved in you, but you can step back and control it. And remembering these three things, I think you'll all be able to go out in life and tell plenty of funny stories of your own. So thank you very much for your time, and we'll do some questions, and I'll also show some video of the movie. And thanks, you can keep clapping. That's okay.